Uh, let's go ahead and open with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us. And we know that we are being sent out into the world to be the light to the world. And it seems like it's very difficult for us to do this mission. We ask you to please give us your grace and please send down the Holy Spirit with all of the gifts so that we may go forth and do the mission that you've put us down here on earth to do. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So today, we're, we talked about marriage and family last week. So now we're going to really take a look about what it's like, what are the problems with living in today's culture, today's society, and trying to be a Catholic. Because these are the things that I think are, are really tough. You've spent this whole year learning about the faith, and now you're being asked and being sent out to live that faith. And it can be pretty trying. I think the world's a, a tough place, especially, you know, and, and maybe in today's time to go ahead and try to fit in. We can fit in with society pretty well, but when we look at the culture, we are really kind of like salmon swimming upstream because we're countercultural right now. And for an example of that, let's look at GQ and their book review that just came out. From, uh, and it was on some very popular books that you would know. One of them is the Bible. And they had problems with that. They panned the Bible. They said it's repetitive, it's self-contradictory, and it's just foolish. So that is just one thing of where you're going to be up against the culture. And when I was putting this talk together, there was one sentence that just kept coming back into my head. And I think you'll recognize it. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief, it was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light, it was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope, it was the winter of despair. We had everything in front of us, we had nothing in front of us. We are all going to heaven, we are all going the other way. Who recognizes that sentence? Gary. Right, written by Charles Dickens in 1859. And I think that really sums up at least my personal feelings of where we are. I was born in 53, and, and some of us that are a little bit older, when we sit around a lot of times, uh, 1953, not 1853. And <laughs> AD. <laughs> yeah, yeah, AD. So when we sit around with our first glass of wine, we start talking about how our world has advanced technologically so far. I mean, things that maybe you don't think of, Andrew, but things like a microwave, we, we never had. Things uh, you know, cars now are going to be self-driving. You know, I remember when air conditioning was a big thing on cars. And, there, and we can just go on and on. And basically, you know, you've got more computing power in that little phone of yours than in 69 when we sent men to the moon. The second glass of wine usually brings around a different discussion. What's happened to our nation? How did we go so fast, so far, away from God. What happened with in God we trust, our motto. And so when I start in my mind looking at just how we go to church, how many people go to church, it seemed back when I was a kid, we didn't ask if you went to church, we usually asked where you went to church. Sundays, and, and Gary and I didn't live too far from Pasadena, if you went up to Pasadena to try to shop for clothes or shoes or something, it was pretty much buttoned up. Sundays was to be with family, uh, to rest, to take it easy, to visit friends maybe, to go on a picnic. 
but it was a very uh, quiet time. I don't recall too many mass murders. I don't recall terrorism being a big thing. I don't uh, recall bullying in school. We have, you know, a few tough kids that you have to deal with, but uh, not bullying like, you know, we know it today, you know, with the internet and everything. But TV, the media in general, was pretty well censored. We didn't have to worry about the language or the sex on TV. Things were kept pretty nice. Sin was something to be ashamed of and embarrassed. Do you hear those words with sin anymore? No, I'm sorry I got caught is what you hear, really. We now call it cohabitation. What did we call it years ago? Living in sin, sin. okay? Uh, so it, now we publicize sin so much that it, it, we do it for shock value, for one thing, when you look at some of the shows. And also, is it that there's a force out there in our culture that's trying to make you think that this is the norm? That if you see that sin enough that you know, sometimes we're like little kids. Well, everybody else is doing it. And maybe I'm looking through the eyes of a child back then. But I do tell you that people inherently are looking at something beyond what they think this life is. Maybe they don't call it God. Maybe they don't recognize it as God. But they're looking for something. And in the 60s, we had astrology. Hey, what's your sign? But that kind of moved on to uh, the new age. And I was just in Sedona a couple of years ago. And it's, wow, the, the vortices and you got to go here and you're going to feel the energy and, and you got to get the crystals and, and they're looking for something else. Then it became a big thing, though, with the witches and warlocks and covens and that whole thing. Vampires are big. They're still looking for something. There's, there's a fascination with something beyond this world. And what's the big thing now? Zombies. <coughs> you know, the, the, you know the, the living dead. So I don't know whether the Catholic Church missed the with it morality. Uh, is it just... Are we not enlightened? The Catholic Church isn't enlightened. What, what happened to us? But there are some signs that I think that we can look at about our, our culture today. And I think we can, uh, let's start out with some conflicts. How do we view life? We view life as being intrinsically valued from conception to natural death and everything in between, not just those two the beginning and the end, but everything in between. Society is telling you, now nah, abortion's fine, euthanasia is fine. Basically, you need to tell me why that life has value. And maybe I'm pregnant and it's inconvenient for that life. And it's being very interesting now with the euthanasia, especially for the elderly. Maybe you don't have value to society. You know what? Make it easy on your family and just will help you kill yourself. Uh, you're, you're really a burden to society. You're, you're uh, eating up valuable time with the doctors or hospitals and, and things like that. It's kind of scary where we're moving that way. The other thing that we talked about last week, so we won't spend too much time on, is the breakdown of the family. It's the unit of society, and when that goes, society goes, and it's the domestic church. We see a great value in it, but we see so many dysfunctional families, single parent families, and, and some of that's you know, natural, but a lot of it is due to the high separation divorce rate. But we also have so many children born out of wedlock, they have no concept, like we said last week, of, of what even a marriage is. I mean, it, it's the 70% of the African Americans are born out of wedlock, and that's a tragedy. So 
we see that going down the, the line. We're told to live in modesty and chastity. That's, that's our thing. But look at the promiscuity that today and the, you know, the STDs out there, just the AIDS epidemic. So we're modesty and chastity and the culture is saying grab all the pleasures of the flesh you can. The sex organs or the reproductive organs, as I learned in school, now are pleasure organs. Okay? We believe in being humble, living in love and charity. And the culture is kind of saying, no, it's prestige, it's power. It's grabbing all that you can accumulate. But let's also look at what's happening, and maybe within our church. Let's not even look at the Protestants. Let's just look at the Catholic Christians and how many are going to church on Sunday. But let's also look at the rise of atheism, the new atheism, and we'll talk about that uh, a little bit later. Sex and violence they, that just permeates all of our entertainment industry. That's, that's a huge thing. What about the suicide rate? And we're gonna look at some of these statistics. It's just, we are going down kind of a very scary path here. But Catholic weekly attendance for mass, and this is Gallup poll, so I would assume fairly reliable. 1955, 75% of the Catholics went to mass. Now it's only about 45% go weekly, and I even think that's high. From what I hear, it's really only about a third go to mass regularly. Protestants have held fairly evenly, oddly enough, over the, the uh, over, you know, that 50, 60 years. But, and Michael and I have had extensive discussions about this, is they're losing people to atheism as well as we are, but we are also tending to, as people leave the Catholic Church, they're not quite ready to walk away from it. They may latch on to a Protestant faith. And what's happening to Protestantism? It's fracturing into tens of thousands of little churches, right? They can't even agree. But they, so we're pouring water into them, and then their sieve also is, is you know, has some big holes in it. Catholic marriage, Villanova University. In 1969, 426,309 Catholic marriages in the United States. 2015, 120,000. At the rate we're going, it's gonna be the year 3000 before we fill up our, our marriage register. It's really sad how few marriages we have. So we went down, I'm sorry, with the allergies and my medication, I get dry. So Catholic marriages since, since 69 have gone down 72%. How many people care about having their marriage religiously recognized? Any idea? 30%. That is all that care to have God involved in readings or a minister or anything like that. According to the CDC, our marriage rate is about 6.9 per 100,000 people. The divorce rate is about 3.2. So it's about 46, 47% of the people are, are getting divorced. Catholics, don't be too proud. I mean, we're at 28%. But I don't think that's anything to be proud of. In other words, if we gather 100 families that just got married or 100 marriage couples that, you know, in Sacramento that were just recently married, 28 of those 100 are going to be separated and filing for civil divorce. Cohabitation, 2016, 18 million people cohabitate. So marriage isn't even on the charts for them. Um, Suicide rates, we said we were gonna talk about those. 2016, 44,965 suicides in the United States. Seventh leading cause of death for males. Ages 10 to 14, children, it is number three. That's a third leading cause of death for children 10 to 14, that's a shame. But then for the 15 to 24 year olds, second leading cause of death. 
and it is rising at an alarming rate. The next statistic I certainly am not proud of, <clears throat> and again, we're going to look at the Catholic Church. And I got this, uh, these numbers from Alan Hunt with Dynamic Catholic. 1.4 million children are baptized into the Catholic Church every year in the United States, roughly. How many of those children will make it to First Communion? 1.3 million. So we lose 100,000. How many make it to Confirmation? One million. So we're losing close to a third. How many at age 22 can be identified as Catholic? Out of 1.4 million, only 120,000. I mean, that is just a staggering type of statistic to me. When we look at our society, our culture, Pope Benedict XVI said there's three things you need to consider. One is secularism, the separation of religion from society. And what that says is the fundamental principle is mankind's conduct needs to be exclusively guided by considerations derived from the present time itself. So religion has absolutely no impact the faith and morals on society. You don't take anything. Everything is about right now. That's the new atheism. It's the relativism. Your truth is your truth. My truth is my truth. And I don't impose my truth on you, and you don't impose yours on me. The mantra is there is no truth. Kind of clashes. We see God as the truth, the way, and the life. We see God as being the truth. And they're saying there is no truth. So there's, there's a huge clash. I just don't know how you, you fight something like that. But I can tell you that you have to keep fighting it. Because their, their mantra doesn't even make sense. There is no truth. Well, if there is no truth, then that statement has to be false. And I can't impose my truth on you, and you can't impose yours on me, but yet those in power are now going to impose their truths on you. And the scary part of this, I think, if you really look at it, is that our rights do not come from God any longer. Your rights are given to you by the laws of the land. And they can take away those rights, or they can give you rights. The second thing he said to look at is consumerism. You're only worth what you can accumulate. Remember the bumper sticker years ago? He, you know, he who dies with the most toys wins. That's kind of it. You are caught up in this whole thing of greed. What can I get? How big is my home? How nice is it? What are the cars I'm driving? Where am I, where am I eating? Where, you know, what wines am I drinking? Uh, where did you go on vacation? Not only did, where did you go on vacation, but where did you stay? It's, this is where you're on this endless trap that becomes this self-doubting about your worth. And I will tell you one thing. You will never have enough, or you will never think you're good enough. And that's, that's the trap. And it leads to a, a, a lot of very sad things. And I think we could look at the very wealthy and our celebrities and see what turmoil lives they lead. The last thing, the third thing that the Pope said to look at is individualism. This is where they're indoctrinating the children today. It's a self-centered life. It's narcissism. It's all about me. And I am the center of the universe. And if things aren't just fair for me, then somebody owes me. But it's vanity on steroids. It's all about a trinity. And that trinity is me, me, and me. And that's the trinity. The other thing that we probably want to put in this category is the addiction for stimulation, for activity. And that can be addiction to technology. It can just be these terrible schedules that we put in our lives. Life has become, looking at that day planner, 
and checking things off and running to the next thing and checking that off and running to the next thing. And we're going to have dinner together, but I've got my phone out and I'm checking messages and I'm looking at something else. And, and you start to get so you don't enjoy life, you're just performing certain functions. The problem gets to be is you start objectifying people. You have dinner, but you're not really interacting with them. Your mind is somewhere else, and you know, I can't really stay for dessert. I promised I would be, you know, somewhere else. You start to objectify people. Hey, nice to see you. I don't care. You know, that, that, you know how you doing? I don't care. You bump to somebody in the store, you talk for a few minutes, geez. Yeah, you know, we'll have to get together. No, I don't want to get together with you. And you took five minutes out of my schedule. What happens is, in this trap, you lose purpose, focus, and clarity. And when you do that, the road gets pretty cloudy and you can start drifting any which way. So we are at war, but do you know who your enemy is? Who are you fighting? There's two. First of all, Jesus told you one, prince of the world. He also called him the murderer, the father of lies. We don't talk nearly enough about the devil and how powerful he is. They put it in movies a little bit, but just kind of be a little bit of villain. But we don't recognize, I think, enough about the power that Satan has. He is smarter than us. In fact, he's smarter than all of us put together. He's more cunning. But he is always out there, and he's using the same play. And this came from Deacon Burke Sivers when he was here talking to us about five, six years ago. He's the gentleman you see on EWTN, the deacon. And he says Satan runs this, the same play. He probably has other plays, but he's using one play because it works all the time. Can you imagine if you were watching TV and your team is on defense, uh, a football game, and the other team runs the ball up the middle, and you go, shoot, you know, they got a touchdown. And you set up again, and they run the ball again for a touchdown. Pretty soon you're screaming at your team, watch out for the run. Satan uses that same play on us. As soon as he can get you to doubt that God loves you more than anything, and he has only the best for you, then he's kind of got you. Because then it, I start thinking that, well, God, I know you love me, but I think I know what's best for me. Basically, I'm going to become my own God. I'll make my own decisions. I, I, I know what the church says and everything, but I think I'll become my own God. And it can be something very insidious as going ahead and saying, I'm on vacation. I'm not going to take the time to look at my cell phone and see where a mass is on Sunday. I'm only going to be here for a couple of days. And you start skipping mass. Or you look at some church teachings and I don't know. That whole thing on birth control doesn't make sense to me. You know, I think it's really between me and my wife. And we know what's best. Uh, God doesn't really understand. And you start now becoming that cafeteria Catholic. I'll believe everything, but I, I'm not going to accept this. And then maybe later on, I'm not going to accept this. And you know, it, eh. I skipped mass before. I'm going to skip it now. Pretty soon, I don't think I really need to go. The other enemy we need to look at is right within us, because we talked about this before with original sin, concupiscence. It's that darkened intellect and that weak and well. We've been baptized, and we're children of God. We have original sin wiped away, but unfortunately, we still have this inclination to the flesh. We like those things that look good. We like the things that taste good and smell good and feel good. It is a constant battle for us against temptation. Both of these enemies you cannot beat on your own. You need God's grace. That's the only way you're going to conquer, conquer this in the world. 
And luckily in the Catholic Church, not only do we have grace, but we have sanctifying grace from the sacraments. And if you remember our talk on the sacramental economy, it was all about that. So we're made fun of in the world. We're persecuted, evil's out there. Um, the laws are now overriding some of our moral beliefs and teachings. And the temptation is, what if I just give in a little bit to get along? There's that, just, just a little bit to get along. And no, don't give in to that. Can you still fit into society? Yes, you can. And my feeling is, actually, society will look up to you. You're going to be countercultural, but society, I think, will say, you know, you're a good person because they're going to see the love. First three things now, we've got to look at, at weapons. But the first three things are slow down, slow down, slow down. Take a look at your life. Are there things in there that maybe don't have to be that free up a little time for you? Is it that to do God's will, you need all of these things in there? Because remember, that's our primary mission. Or are we doing them because the world says we need to do it? Does that child need to have three activities after school and just be running from one thing to another? Do you need to be involved in this, involved in that, involved in this, playing golf with your friends, playing poker with your friends, doing whatever? Can you carve something out? Because remember, you're not going to hear God unless you're listening and you're quiet. That is the way he talks to you in, in silence. So try to unplug from the technology. Let go of the TV, the internet, the video games, and the social media. No offense, I really don't care where you ate dinner last night. I really don't. And if you care where I ate dinner last night, then there's something wrong with your life that that becomes so important to you. But I've been with people that as soon as you get free time, I, I, I got to go see what my kids posted today. I've got to see what my friend posted today. I got to, I got I got to, and all they, they're doing is looking at everybody's life. They're not living their own. The second thing I want you to do with that little bit of time you free up is pray and listen. I want you to pick up the Bible and for 15 minutes, read the Bible. Maybe only 10 to start, and five minutes to just sit there. What's God saying to me? And I want you to start with the Gospels and work your way through those. I want you to make it a habit. If there's one habit you're going to build, that's it. And when we talked about prayer, you've got to have that place in your house or that place somewhere that you go, and for 15 minutes, that's your spot and your time to build that relationship with God. That's what prayer is. You can take it one step further, and I'll encourage you to do that, especially as, as new Catholics, is get involved in a Bible study. Trust me, you did not learn everything there is to know about Catholicism. At age 64, almost 65, I feel like all I've seen is a crack through the fence to see what God is like. I'm just now getting a glimpse, and I've been studying pretty hard the last 20-some years. Make friends in the church community. This is your team, right? We're all teammates. Make friends in the church. Get involved in a ministry, maybe music ministry. Go ahead. If there's a project and they're doing something, sign up for it. Meet some of your friends. Uh, Alan Hunt says, how many of you sit in the same spot every week in church? Peace be with you. Peace be with you. And same people. You know, how about tapping them on the shoulder at the end of Mass and say, hey, let's go have coffee and donut. I see you every week. I'd like to get to know you a little bit. Make some friends. The next thing is huge. It's a huge, huge way, huge weapon. You got to participate in Mass. I don't want you attending Mass. I don't want you going to Mass. I want you to participate. I want you to get there 10 minutes early. I want you to get there and just ask God for a minute. 
I'm here in your presence. I want you to check everything at the door. I want to leave the rest of my life out there. For this next hour or so, it's you and me. Take open the missalette. Read the readings for today. And then you got a few minutes extra. Just grab that inside cover of the bulletin, and they kind of have a little explanation. It gets you thinking about it. Then when it's proclaimed, the word of God is proclaimed, now you, you really can start to interact with it. You can really be fed by it. But just remember that we are teammates in there going through our training. We are going to try to pick up knowledge and build our reflexes. We've got the winning coach in there. Jesus is the winning coach. Trust me, I read the end of the Bible. I know how the game ends. Why would you not want to be on the winning team? But this is where we practice, because I guarantee you, once you leave this church property, that's where the game is. It's all out there, and things can come at you pretty fast. But through your training and everything, you know how to, how to fend it off or not get caught in the trap and not get tagged out. So make sure that you get there, you train hard, and you train to win. That's, that is absolutely huge. This is the source and the summit of our faith in there. Don't buy into the culture. Keep your eye on the prize. Keep your eye on heaven. Laugh at the advertising. Forget the consumerism. Uh, it, it'll take a ton of pressure off of you. One commercial comes to mind, and it's a nicely dressed person gets into the car, the car door closes, nice luxury car. And it's that sound of that car door closing like in a showroom. Where, man, that car sounds like it's just great. Person puts the key and turns it on, this modern display comes up, the engine kicks over, it is so sweet. When you turn your car on, does it do the same for you? What is that all about? It's a car. I mean, what are they trying to sell you? Do you see how, how easy it is to get caught up in their trap? I gotta have that car. My car doesn't turn me on. Well, I hope not. Control what you ingest with your eyes and your ears. Out there, the, the, the media has so much that just a little bit of poison over a long period of time will kill you. I guarantee you. Don't be a source of sin for others. Watch what you tend to take in. Watch your, or put out your language, your ideas uh, that you express, how you interact with people. You know, guys in this world, try not to objectify women. And women, try to watch how you dress so you're not tempting us. We got to help each other in this. We can win. And then we, we talk about one other thing. Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. And I hear that. That's fine for your taxes. That's fine for the vehicle code out there. If it says 35, do 35. When it comes to faith and morals, you stick to Mother Church. You hold on to Mother Church. Despite what other things may come up through politics, they dragged our faith and morals into politics. We didn't ask them to be put there. There's going to be a lot of attacks on us, and we talked about it. The artificial contraception, um, you know, the definition of marriage, uh, abortion, abortion, euthanasia, embryonic stem cells, you know, how they're being used, how we see them. If you're confused or you have a question, consult your catechism. Talk to the priest. Go ahead, and you're, you're just the world's got your mind whirling. Go down to the chapel for a little bit. Take it to Jesus himself. Get a little peace in your life. So I'm going to leave you with one story. When I was about six years old and I was living, we lived just outside of Gary, Indiana. And a terrible storm late afternoon came up. And like tornado warnings, tornado watches, I can't remember what. Winds were going. We lived fairly modestly. We didn't have a garage. We didn't even have a carport. And my mom says, hey, can one of you boys go out and check and see if the car's all locked up? Well, she was really talking to my two older brothers. But I'm a man. I'm six years old. 
I run outside. That wind was blowing so hard, I made it from the front porch and I grabbed onto a tree. And that tree was probably only about six or eight inches. And I just remember being scared to death holding onto that tree with my eyes closed. And in just a little bit of time, my older brother came, grabbed me by the arm, took me into the house to safety. The winds, the storms out there are really pounding against us. That church is your tree. You grab onto that faith and you hold on for dear life. And when it's all over, Jesus is going to grab you by the arm, take you into heaven. And he's going to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. So thank you very much. We'll go ahead and close with a final prayer. <clears throat> In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear Lord, we know that we cannot do this without your grace, that we cannot be that person, that special somebody, that unique entity you made each and every one of us to be. We need your help. And we will do our part to go forth and be the light to the world. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Yeah. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>